Hello, my name is Jamie Clements and I am president of the Museum of New Mexico Foundation. I wanna welcome you to this special presentation on native glass art. Our special guests tonight are Leroy Garcia, owner of Blue Rain Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico, who will interview Preston Singletary, a renowned native glass artist based in Washington State. There will be a live Q&A after the presentation, so please feel free to submit your questions anytime during the interview using the Q&A button on your screen. We will begin with a short video of Preston working in his studio, then move directly into the interview. I now invite you to sit back and enjoy the show. tonight's interview with Preston Singletary, a uh, glass artist extraordinaire from the Northwest Coast. Um, I first met uh, Preston in 1998. I had uh, read an article in uh, Indian Artist Magazine at the time, and um, it just struck me that somebody uh, in the native genre was working in glass. Uh, prior to that, Blue Rain had tried to sell uh, carved masks and uh, bent wood boxes and all these wonderful uh, things from the Northwest Coast. We, we just couldn't make way uh, with that medium. And so I remember calling Preston and I'm like, hey, Preston, this is Leroy Garcia. I own a gallery in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, we, we sell native, contemporary native art. We'd love to sell your work as well. And he's like, oh, well, Maybe I'll send you a couple of pieces. And uh, so our relationship started and um, away we went uh, almost 23 years now uh, working together. So I feel honored to be able to uh, interview Preston today. Uh, we've had a wonderful journey and uh, he's considered in, in many people's minds, but especially mine as a pioneer in the field. And um, he's, He's been uh, great at sharing uh, his knowledge with others and uh, really appreciate that. Um, so let's talk about glass. Preston, um, are, you, are you on? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, there we go, there we go. So um, tell us about how you got started in glass itself because at first you were not necessarily doing native imagery. Ta tell us who started this whole journey out for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, a good friend from Seattle um, actually moved up from California uh, named Dante Marioni. Dante <clears throat> had a father, well, <laughs> has a father who is also a, an old uh, hippie glass artist, um, very involved with the Pilchuck Glass School. And so Dante, you know, Paul was the first glass artist I ever met, and that was in uh, 19. 76 or something and um, so Dante and I became really fast friends. Dante started working in the glass uh, taking lessons and working for the glass size studios in 1982 um, he was working there full time and I was kind of in between jobs I was um, working in restaurants and things like that and uh, he called me up and said hey I can get you a job at the glass eye studios glass eye factory and so I started working there as the night watchman. I kind of quickly, I mean, I knew a lot of the people that worked there and they knew me well, you know, seeing me as a teenager growing up. So they got me onto the, the production floor pretty quickly. Um, I was about six months later. 
and uh, just kind of threw me into the into the onto the work floor, and and I started to make Christmas balls and paperweights and things like that. Um, you know, like 1983, uh, I met uh, Lino Telia Pietra, um, the Italian master glass bar. I was able to watch him blow glass, and that kind of fueled the uh, enthusiasm with Dante and I. We wanted to learn these techniques and and pushed ourselves to uh, to develop them together. And I used to assist him and many, many other people um, through Benjamin Moore's uh, Glass Studios, uh, another prominent glass artist in Seattle. Um, so I basically learned through practical experience. I learned uh, through working with other people. I learned by going up to the Pilchuck Glass School. I, um, you know, so that, that was the, the foundation. And it wasn't until 1988 that I started to dabble in the in the form line design, uh, which I call, you know, the art, the the design style that makes up my uh, my uh, cultural uh, art style, um, and that's kind of how it started. So let's let's talk a little bit about uh, your heritage. Uh, tell us a little bit about your dad and your mom. Yeah, I mean, my my mother um, is uh, half Plinket and half Filipino. Um, my great grandmother was um, she moved down from Sitka, Alaska in the 20s. And so she uh, she was widowed and she was remarried. She brought uh, her children, including my grandmother, um, who uh, in turn in the Seattle area met a Filipino man and then married him. And uh, so my, that's how my mother, the Filipino, was introduced into the family. Um, my father is non-native, so he's mixed European, but uh, both my parents are very creative and very, um, you know, had a lot of varied interests. And so that's where I feel like I got a lot of my creative uh, impetus, you know, to, to, to work with lots of different things. Um, uh, my mother and my father were very handy and, and uh, played music and sang Delta Blues. And so it was always a lot of creativity around me. And that's where... I feel, uh, I mean, so my first love is music, you know, and I like to talk about that a lot, but the, uh, the, um, the glass art th that I do um, is what supports my music habit, so. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about um, this. So you're, you were raised, uh, born and raised in Seattle? Correct, yeah, yeah. So I was born outside of the uh, Clinkett community. I was raised around uh, glass, glass blowers. <laughs> Yeah. So, so um, having a little bit of disconnect from your heritage, when did you start taking interest in your heritage? As um, you know, so my my great grandmother, we, you know, we spent a lot of time with her, and we have a big, have a lot of cousins and aunties, and so um, still connected to that matrilineal kind of society that is the the native community, um, and uh, raised by you know. My grandmother and my aunties, you know, supported by all these women, um, and you know, a lot. Some of my aunties are really, really involved in the native community, um, sort of a multinational native community in the, in the Northwest. But uh, uh, we spent a lot of time around my great grandmother, and she always impressed upon us where she came from, uh, where we came from, and uh, when I started to think about uh, how to create my own kind of uh, unique mark in the glass, uh, uh, the glass world and the glass, uh, uh, with the material of glass, I, I decided, well, I should look to my, my cultural background. And so then I started to develop that. And that's really how, you know, it reconnected me with uh, family, um, with my tribe, with my community. And that was one of the most fulfilling things that I could have done. So is this where you're getting your knowledge of uh, design and stories and stuff from your aunties and your grandma? You know, it, it, it was, um, I've been able to synthesize stories from my family and make them in art uh, art pieces, you know, through totem poles and, and other sort of narratives that I create around the artwork. Um, so in, in some ways, you know, I'm looking back and looking, reflecting on, on the traditional stories and symbolism, and then sometimes I'm able to make it more abstract and make it, uh, and make new interpretations. So that's kind of, um, where I find myself today. 
So when, when was your uh, first native form made? Because you were, you were studying yeah. a more European uh, classical form. Yeah, I mean, I, so the early, the early glass blowing process, I was all about learning the material, uh, learning how to handle it and what can I do with it, how to shape it, you know, and then getting physically acclimated to the process. And so um, I uh, started dabbling in about 1988 uh, while I was at the Pilchuck Glass School. And I figured out an, um, uh, kind of a sandblasting etching process that um, I saw another artist was using. And I thought that I could maybe employ that to create the design work on my glass pieces. And so um, like, like the piece that's right behind you, uh, Leroy, you know, that, that, that panel really typical of the design style that I had to become accustomed to. And, and so it was really a, a kind of a relearning or a reinventing myself, um, you know, because I wasn't uh, an illustrator or I didn't have, I wasn't really adept at drawing, but I had to, you know, to train and practice and find mentors and find, um, you know, uh, ways of learning, you know, I, in the very beginning, I was copying things out of books and, you know, until I really got it, until it clicked, until I understood the architecture of the design style, and then I can um, create infinite varieties of designs, uh, you know, uh, for the future. So I noticed the, the, when we first started working together, you made a lot of discs and hats and globe rattles, and it was almost uh, limited to those three type of <laughs> images. Yeah. Um, and then you made uh, some of your first rattles that we got. We were so impressed. It's like, wow, yeah. check this out in glass. When did you yeah. come up with the idea to experiment into rattles? Well, you know, for a long time, I, I tried to uh, mimic certain kinds of things uh, in the material of glass, you know, if it was a bowl or if it was a dish. And, um, you know, so as my skills evolved, then I was able to advance the style. I took workshops up at Pilchuck from uh, Pino Signorito, who's another Italian master who uh, was a very amazing sculptor he made figures and he could he could manipulate the glass in such a way that it gave me a lot of um, insight to how could I you know develop my work and push it in new ways and so as I've you know taken uh, either this sculpting approach very seriously I've been able to push into new into new territory uh, and I try to do that all the time um, so, th th so I noticed the shapes were transforming more complex shapes, but your your designs were getting tighter and more definitive to um, a lot of the Northwest Coast seems like their imagery is based uh, along the lines of tra transformation from animal to human form. Is that yeah. something you still follow? Is that the main design? Yeah, this? yeah, that's you know. So there's. Um, a lot of the artwork and totem poles, you know, it, it's a visual language and it's an oral tradition. And so these totem poles and uh, and all these designs basically pertain to certain families. So there's a lot of there's a lot of issues of intellectual property around uh, my cultural art. Um, certain stories belong to certain families, and you're not really, you know. Uh, supposed to use them for monetary gain you know there's you know the system for the artwork the production of the artwork has changed uh drastically over the years um uh and and but you know i find that the the shaman material is is something that's really rich in imagery and imagination and you know when i'm looking at the old shaman material to me it also kind of alludes to the spiritual uh, component of the of our community, um, and so the things that I make that are inspired by shamans' amulets—they're not really shaman amulets, but they are um, inspired by that type of thing. And you know, over the years, I've been able to figure out ways how to create more narratives around them, so I can give them—you know—maybe I had some kind of. Um, you know, uh, an experience or something, and then and like, oh, I could, I could, man I could manifest that in a particular art piece. So I could put myself as a human figure and have you know this raven uh, figure next to it, and you know, then 
I can, you know, kind of make up a story around that, you know, that something, something that might have happened. So that's where the, you know, the really, the, the fun kind of begins. I mean, every day is, uh, is a new adventure for, for me. When I go into my studio, it's just like, okay, you know, well, what am I going to make? It, you know, it, there's an element of um, kind of fun and excitement there. Uh, before we go on, I, I, I was hoping you would uh, recant uh, the story of your, your grandmother and uh, the, the bears out there. Oh, yeah. yeah so <laughs> I made, a, I made a, a totem pole that was um, represented my great-grandmother who had a pet grizzly bear as a child. And she um, it was, I mentioned she lived in Sitka, Alaska. And it was the time, at the turn of the century, there was a lot of Russians in that area. And there was a woman who made saltwater taffy and she, um, you know, for sale. And so my great grandmother would go out and pick berries in the forest uh, and bring them back and sell them to people to get Russian money so she could buy taffy for her little, her pet, you know. And so I made this uh, totem pole. It was a, a seven and a half foot sculpture. I work collaboratively with carvers, you know, and I'll design the totem pole and then I'll have people carve it for me. And in this case, I actually transformed it into glass. So about 2,000 pounds of glass, um, you know, this totem pole stands, uh, you know, seven and a half feet. And uh, so, in, so in that way, I'm, I feel like I'm keeping the tradition alive because the totem poles actually should tell a story. That's, that's their purpose, you know. And with that object, then the person can tell the narrative of that story. That's awesome. I, I love that story. <laughs> it's good to uh, remember those uh, things in our, in our family's past. Uh, some of them are fun. Um, let's turn and talk about uh, your relationship with Blue Rain and the journey that we've had together. Um, like I said, in, in 1998, uh, for some reason, you took a risk on us <laughs> and uh, came into the gallery. Uh, by 2000, uh, I had invited you and uh, your assistant, Joe uh, Benavido, uh, and you drove your little hot shop all the way from Seattle <laughs> to Taos. Yeah. And oh, that, that was a historic moment because it was the first time uh, we were able to introduce the process uh, to the native art community or to the collectors of the native art community mm -hmm. and it started opening their eyes and I mean we, we were selling things not at the rate we were now but it was the beginning you know, we were yeah. setting a, a yeah. foundation uh, tell us about those those early days in Taos yeah I, you know that was uh, one of my one of the things I miss is the trips up to Taos I love going up there um, I used to love having an excuse to go up there um, not that I couldn't, I can't go there right now, but uh, I, I uh, yeah, Leroy called me out of the blue and you know, left a message on my phone and that was sort of like a, um, you know, that was a common thing, you know, that, you know, so, 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 so and so from this gallery in, um, you know, Chattanooga, it's wherever, you know, in the middle of somewhere, I didn't know. Um, and um, so I called him back and then there was no, there was no answering machine and I was like what kind of gallery doesn't even have an answering machine on there you know for their business I'm like gosh you know I don't know about these guys okay so then we get into this conversation Leroy's like oh yeah we're blue rain gallery and you know we, we uh you know anyway he sold me I, I came down um first couple of shows or it was I don't know if it was just the first one or first and second or whatever um we um yeah I mean I brought my work down there uh, set it up in the gallery. It looked great, you know, and uh, people looked at it and looked at it and circled it and looked at it and, you know, like right over to the ceramic pots, you know, probably Tammy's work or something, you know. And then I was like, you know, because, you know, the thing is in the Northwest, you know, the glass is has such a, such a high kind of uh, profile, you know, there is ceramics here too. When the glass came along, you know, the ceramics were kind of like, you know, cousins but you know kind of in competition with each other and so um anyways you know we we uh you know i kind of you know i flew back home kind of oh gosh you know tail between my legs you know like didn't didn't have a great show but i loved the experience i loved getting to know everybody i loved um you know the gallery's perspective of like working with a lot of contemporary native people and you know many of which became really great friends and i and so 
you know, I, I, I love, you know, going down and seeing the, the, the market. I love going down and, um, uh, you know, meeting new people, seeing what, uh, native artists are doing, you know, uh, how do they interpret their culture for, you know, this current day and age. Right. So, uh, the glass blowing demos did, uh, serve a great function of, uh, of uh, educating people around, you know, how much work it goes into making a glass piece. And I remember that particular show, you, I, you know, so I, we did the demo, we put the piece away, you know, put it in the box and people were, you know, clapping and then, and then they kind of like wandered into the, into the gallery and then started buying pieces. Like <laughs> it was like, Oh my God, you know? So it was, it was like the, the curse was broken, you know, and, uh, um, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, I find more and more people, you know, the more I mean, I've been coming down, what, for 22 years now or more. And and um, and so, yeah, that collector community is just always amazing and supportive. And, you know, I just, you know, I can't say enough about that and and Leroy's connection to them and bringing them into the gallery and what have you. So it's been a great partnership. <laughs> Let's talk about for the last ten minutes of this segment uh, or for, of this interview. Let's talk about what I consider the biggest uh, introduction of glass into the native art community, uh, especially the, the ceramics. Was when I think me and you were on the same page. We're like, you know, yeah. Preston, you, you're carving into glass. Uh, Tammy Garcia is carving into clay. Why can't we do? glass with those type of imageries mm -hmm. and so can you can you talk about the the first collaboration uh, with tammy and yeah how yeah i mean so i remember kind of hinting around at it for you know almost every time because i was like wow this this really, we should really do this and eh, you know the time wasn't right and then finally you know we got together on the same page and said let's let's do it let's i mean it was such a no-brainer to me because of the the carving process and the stencil process that I use would be, you know, able to translate those designs perfectly and um, and uh, so we had a great time. I mean, we got together and worked in the hot shop together. Um, we, you know, these designs were very traditional, and I and I really it was kind of you know going back to my roots as a glass blower, uh, making you know, traditional vessels. So that was really fun for me. And I thought that the, the results were spectacular. I mean, I thought, I mean, I got, I, again, like I say, working, being around other contemporary native artists is really a key factor. I, let me just say in the broader context, indigenous artists, because I've, you know, I've worked with Maori and, uh, New Ze uh, and from New Zealand and Australian Aboriginal artists, natives from, all over, all around the country, um, and that is really what kind of um, uh, gives me a lot of inspiration because it makes me, it challenges me, and uh, I, I do things that I wouldn't normally do. And then, by way of doing that, I can show examples um, on a very high level what what the possibilities are. Um, and from from my perspective, uh, what that show did too, where where Tammy was already in an elevated form. Uh, as far as her collector base, it 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 put you in a position of hey, pay attention to this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because that, is uh, that component too for sure. Yeah, because it, it was introducing you to the highest end of the collector base that we had, and I think that helped elevate some things right there. Uh, then uh, you did three three collaborative shows with Tammy. I think you guys produced about 120 plus pieces or so over those years. <laughs> uh, we did uh, three shows. Yeah, and then in between that, uh, the Tammy shows, you did uh, the Maori show. And then uh, you did a show with Marcus Emmerman. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that show uh, was beautiful. It's historic, but we had a hard time getting people to connect with it because Marcus is such a great artist, but he's a beater. You know, he's one of the best beat artists out there. Uh, yep. But but what he chose to do with you was mound uh, pots with faces and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I figured that that was a pretty good challenge for you trying to figure out how to do faces and pots. Yeah, that was a challenge. That I mean, that like I said, it, it always kind of pushing me out of my comfort zone, and um, and and I learn by doing that, interacting with all these these different artists. 
Yeah. Um, how was it when the first time you took uh, Jody Naranjo to, to the uh, glass shop? Do you remember her ice? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was really a lot of fun. I mean, Jody is such a great person and, you know, really creative and just a lot of fun to be around. I mean, she's just like, you know, irresistible. Uh, you know, working with her was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, again, getting back to the classical vase forms, um, and, you know, just like, you know, just to see her excitement and enthusiasm, uh, around, you know, seeing us make the work, you know, I mean, it was, I, I was always pushing to like, make it just perfect, you know, and she goes, oh, no, no, that's fine. Stop there. You know, uh, <laughs> that looks great. You know, don't do anything more to it. Uh, you know, and, and so, yeah, there's, and, and now she's really, uh, applying herself and, taking the next step and cutting the stencil. I used to cut everyone's stencil, uh, you know, that I worked with. Um, but she, uh, now she's learning how to do that herself and um, it makes the work, you know, even better and, and easier uh, for both of us. So yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. I think in this upcoming show, we also have works that you did uh, collectively with uh, Harlan Riano. And I, I wanted you to talk about the scale of difficulty of doing the figurative work. <laughs> oh, with, with Harlan, yeah. Oh, God, that was uh, that was a challenge. So he wanted these uh, kind of warrior figures or clown figures, and they were like, you know, these hands that are pumped up like this, and um, you know, and then these stylized heads and all this. And um, so each element had to be made in advance, and each element had to be brought back up to temperature and kind of stuck and melted onto the form and. And then the, the design work was just wrapped around every, you know, bicep and, and body. And it was, oh, my God, it was just such a challenge to cut those stencils. But they were, you know, again, um, those were another thing that challenged me. But it's, that's, the, that's the beauty of it. It was a, a body of work that well, technically we had thought would take six months and it ended up taking almost two years. <laughs> yeah. Think about that. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah. Really, really hard work. I, I, yeah, yeah. I hope everybody who's watching this uh, Zoom conference gets a chance to see the exhibit and, and see your influence. Um, there's a couple other uh, people in this show. I, I don't have the total list, but one of them's Ira Lujan. And I know that he, you've been a big influence on him and particularly through uh, Pilchuck School. And then I, I don't know if uh, Spooner Marcus was involved in that as well. Did he get up there to uh, Pilchuck or where did he I, learn his class? I don't recall if he's been to Pilchuck, but Ira's a good, you know, just a, a great guy and you know I'm so happy for his success and uh, growth you know as an artist and uh, glass maker um, you know he's pushing himself and and trying new things all the time as well and um, but that's really cool to see the glass really take a get a foothold in this in the southwest you know that was one thing that I think is really really important um, and now that you know with the work that Spooner and, and Ira and even uh, Ramson Lomotawama, you know, he's, he's another, uh, uh, he's Hopi, you know, and he was up at Pilchuck. I met him in, geez, like 2000 or yeah, 2005 or six or something. And yeah, so we, it's been great to, you know, keep up with these guys and see that they've, they're getting some, you know, some good uh, support for their work. Yeah. The other person was uh, Tony, Tony Hola. Tony Hola, Ho -ho yeah, Tony is, uh, you know, and Tony, yeah, of course, Tony, I mean, gosh, Tony was the guy I met in 1984, the very first year that I went up to Pilchuck, so that was like two years after I started blowing glass, I go up to Pilchuck, and I meet Tony Hohola and Larry Avacanas, like, and they're, you know, two natives, you know, and I was like, okay, so I was, I, you know, I, you know, so I go up to Larry, I was like, oh, I'm Alaskan native too, and he's like, yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm from Barrow, Barrow, Alaska. He says, "Yeah, I went, I once like uh, built a, a a glass studio on the permafrost up in Barrow, Alaska, and I was blowing glass <laughs> until until you know the heat from the furnace started to melt the ice, and the the you know, the furnace started to list off, and you know over to the side, and they had to shut it down. But um, yeah, so those guys, I mean, some of the earliest pioneers of of glass art." Um, also included in the exhibition 
And, you know, those guys too, I mean, got to give them a lot of credit for like encouraging me, you know, when I was just a, a two year glass blower uh, at that time. And they, they really, uh, um, those guys are some of my greatest uh, mentors and greatest friends. Well, Preston, I know we could probably spend uh, hours talking. I uh, want to thank you for, for attending and hopefully you get some good questions. Uh, yeah. Not only are you a pioneer, but you're an ambassador. And I hope uh, these exhibits elevate you to uh, where you're going. Great. Go ahead and oh, take over there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Leroy and Preston, thank you both so much. We do have some questions. Ironically, the first question for Preston is about his musical interests. <laughs> not glass art okay yeah, get, so it, get the music in there okay so yeah I, I music was my first love it was the the thing that i thought i was going to do as a career um but you know in the end it didn't really pan out for me but i still play music i have a group right now called kuik which means uh potlatch in the clinket language and it's spelled k-h-u-e-e-x and i have a website www kuiks.com um and you know so that is uh something that is a passion that i still um you know continue to nurture in fact we just performed last week and uh it's sort of a live stream concert through uh, a native art festival at, uh through washington state history museum so we did get to you know play together uh for uh this concert and so it, was, it felt like, you know, for a few minutes, it felt like the world was still normal, except for we all had masks on our face and, um, you know, but it was, it was a great time. We had uh, a lot of fun. We, we were, you know, we've got uh, three triple albums out. We've got a, a fourth triple album, album coming out and we have new material. It will be the beyond, you know, beyond all that. So, um yeah, you can check us out. I'm, I'm speaking with um, the, the uh, what is it called? The Meredith's um, uh, Magazine, the first uh, American, his first American art? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. American Meredith's Magazine. Uh, yeah. First American, I think. First American artist. Magazine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. First American people. I, I forget. Anyway, so she's going to do, uh, they're going to do some writing about the band, hopefully in a, upcoming issue. Great. So uh, we have a question from a couple in Wichita, Kansas. Oh. And they said that they saw your exhibit at the Wichita Art Museum. Correct, yes. Um, um, and so they were just asking about that exhibit. Um, and what, what can you tell us about uh, that? Yeah, that, that, so that's a pretty major um, exhibit for me that's uh, touring. It originated at the Museum of Glass um, in Tacoma, Washington. They supported me with, uh, you know, the uh, uh, hosting it for the first year. Now they've tour they're touring the exhibition. It's in Kansas now through uh, mid-January. And then it's supposed to open up at the Smithsonian um, it, November between November 2021 and March 2022 somewhere in that window we hope that we'll be able to open up there um, and then beyond that it's going to go to the, the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk Virginia but this this exhibition was a major kind of next level exhibition for me it was uh, exploring the story of Raven in the Box of Daylight it's a very old old traditional story how Raven stole the sun and placed it in the sky. Um, so it's, it's kind of a long, it's one of the most famous stories of the Clinket uh, in the Northwest here. Um, and it, um, you know, it's, it, was a, it was a way for me to kind of play with installation and narrative. Um, so I tried to create the, the objects as you were walking through the exhibition, you're getting the whole thread of the story. And it's enhanced with sound and it's enhanced with uh, video. Um, you know, wide projection video um, and uh, as sort of as a backdrop. So I'm trying to create like an immersive experience. Um, so I, I composed music for it or use the Clinket language so um, you can hear it, you know, maybe, obviously, maybe you don't know what it means or what it's saying, but um, so that was the, the nature of that show. And so that was for me, um, a really a real major endeavor <laughs> that uh, 
almost impoverished me, but I, I pulled it off and it's there for for people to enjoy, at least on a limited level at this point. But, you know, this is supposed to be my breakout year where I was, uh, you know, touring the country and oh, having my, no. my, my touring rock show. But uh, so <laughs> uh, I'm impressive. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it's just uh, on hold and yeah. we'll get back to that, you know. Yeah, Looking right. forward to us all getting out and about again and being able to enjoy each other's company and uh, have, you know, exhibitions and what have you. Yeah, we're all <laughs> hungry for that. There's no question. Yeah. So I've had a couple of questions about your background, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the yellow and blue panels mm. with the opposing color circles. Yeah. Can yeah. you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so this was a piece that was commissioned by the Museum of Glass and the first museum exhibition I had with them, which was in about 2009. And uh, they commissioned me to make this large screen. That screen is behind me is a wall mounted panels, which is it's about, uh, gosh, I forget, but I think it's about, um, say about 12 by nine feet high. Um, and those, um, no, that, that can't be, no, the, this poster are about six feet high. So they're about six feet by, you know, 10, 12 feet wide, uh, the, the panels in the back. And so the, uh, the panel is sort of like, we call it sort of, um, a house screen or a kind of a heraldic, um, uh, symbol that would separate the chief's quarters with in, in the interior of a clan house. And then the, the posts on either side, they're actually house posts, which um, cover up the support beams with, in the interior of uh, the clan house. So those were more just decorative. And so those, um, if you could see them up close, they have like kind of a human figure holding this round circle. And then the round circles have both the eagle and the killer whale, which are the some of the main crest symbols that uh, pertain to my family, my connection to the Clinket tribe. Great, thank you. So here's a question that says, what are some resources to learn more about Northwest native mythology? Well, you know, you can go to um, Sea Alaska Heritage Institute um, and they are located in Juneau, Alaska and they've got a lot of resource uh, material there. Um, the Burke Museum, uh, the University of Washington is also a great resource um, for that. Uh, they've got a research center there, the Bill Holm Center, uh, probably a lot of material uh, available uh, on that site there. Um, the, field, the Field Museum too. Yeah, the Field Museum in Chicago. There's, uh, uh, you know, the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, if you're up in Alaska, there would be the, the Museum of History and um, Art in Anchorage. Great, thank you. Well, Here's a question that says, please discuss USA versus Canada IP issues about Native art. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a technical, technical question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, Canadian... Um, you know, before there was a, a border between U.S. And Canada, those tribes, you know, were freely crossing those territories, um, and you know they. they uh, he, hey, Leroy, mute your. Uh, I think I'm getting this echo. Um, uh, it, so what? Uh, yeah, the intellectual property issues are quite um, complex. So you've got um, in the Clinket tribe and the Haida tribe, the Haida are the, are the, are the Canadian sister tribe to the Clinket. So um, they share a lot of similarity, uh, cult, uh, you know, cultural similarities, artistic, you know, and uh, history and all of that. Um, so basically in the Clinket tribe, you're, it's split into two moieties. You've got the eagle, you've got the raven. Um, and under each, either eagle or raven, you've got other um, animal symbols that basically relate 
to those moiety and you're born into your mother's crest you're born into the so for instance uh, my, my mother is an eagle uh, and then by tribal law I would marry over to the raven side of the um, of the tribe okay so my raven that I married happens to come from the other side of the world from Sweden but that's another story um, so um, in any case each particular um, you know animal symbol or crest symbol has objects and stories that pertain to that particular family and so the, you know there there's been there's been uh, a few stories that have become a little bit more in the so-called public domain you know um and like the raven story is one of them it's so so well known and shared by many many different uh uh sort of clans that you know you can um you know we we share those stories a little bit more freely but there's certain um um there's certain historic objects which really basically we call it a ooh, and that's sort of a, a thing that is an heirloom that is ca uh, cared for by the clan leader um, the house leader and so they might have certain objects that um, represent that particular clan and that lineage and they're cared for by an individual and when he passes on the next one comes in and and continues to care for that. They're also, you know, keepers of cultural knowledge from the stories to the history, to the language, to the, you know, um, the songs and the dances and everything. At one point it was all one thing, you know, so the, 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 um, there might be a particular story and a song that goes with the story. And there might be an object that goes with the, you know, that's danced and, that, and, and what have you. So, so these, these types of things are, you know we don't we don't mess with those things we don't you know take other people's crest symbols like verbatim like i wouldn't copy someone else's crest symbol and turn it into glass unless i was asked to if i was commissioned to do it then i would i would i would happily do it you know if they wanted to pay for you know the materials and all that but the uh um so the, you know it's it's quite complex and 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 the you know everybody is familiar with the term potlatch you know the potlatch is um is a kuik it's a kuik that's the name of my band um and and it is basically a, a time in which the tribal politics and all the protocols are are adhered to and um a chief would spend um absorbent amounts of energy and time to amass material wealth to be able to host specific clans uh, that would be invited to that particular potlatch. And then in sort of a grandiose um, pageantry, you know, these objects, you know, blankets and carvings and, you know, dishes and, you know, whatever they might have would be distributed. So the only way that you could elevate your status within the community was to host a potlatch um, and give all your stuff away. You know, and so it wasn't about, you know, how much stuff you actually had. Your your reputation was what, what um, held you in that high esteem. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, it's very interesting. There's, there's so much that can be learned from Native culture. Um, you know, this respecting of the opposites is something that was always adhered to. Um, if, if my... If one of my tribal members did something wrong to your tribal member, um, uh, and and I would I would bring you together, and I would say we we know we're we're taking responsibility for this member of our of our family of our clan. We know that they did something wrong to you, and and we want to pay a restitution to you, and from this day forward we'll never talk about it again. And once once the opposite moiety is is uh, is satisfied and they agree to the terms, that they, they put it aside. Um, you know, if you think about that in this day and age, in the context of the world that we live in, in our country, and you know the things that we've done to other countries, you know, you know will we ever ever stand up for those things that we did wrong to a particular country um, in history? You know, I mean. There, these these things are are really really poignant and really important learnings and teachings that 
can that anybody can learn something from. Um, you know, there's hopefully the spirit of, you know, this will prevail. We'll, we'll get back to a place where we can respect, we can respect other people. We can respect people who are not like us, people who, um, you know, come from other places and, uh, and gain some understanding of, you know, who they are, what they, what, you know, that's, that's what, uh, um, <laughs> anyway, I'll stop there. I, you know, these, that yeah. sounds like a good model for conflict resolution. Trust me, mm -hmm. we need better models today than mm -hmm. we have. So a couple more questions. Uh, this one is in your work, do you make a conscious decision on how much you want to balance honoring the traditional Tlingit art and bringing it into something new? Do you see this balance evolving as you go into the future? You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time um, trying to make my work look like traditional uh, objects, you know, like the objects that are behind me in the my virtual <laughs> virtual reality here, um, you know, those are close to uh, pro approximations of what it might look like, but it's in the material of glass. And so I've found opportunities to um, uh, be creative and create abstractions based on some of these design elements that I'm working with. Uh, sometimes I'll see a small shape in an object and I think, oh, that, that would be really cool as a sculpture, you know, so I, I, I'm able to, um, to uh, then, you know, I mean, I, I get, get a lot of inspiration from the modernist uh, art movement and primitivism, um, the whole uh, genre of, you know, the modernists that were being inspired by African art, being inspired by uh, Native American art, oceanic art. And uh, in some cases, I'll take inspiration from those kinds of objects and I'll make a spare organic form and I'll put you know, Northwest Coast imagery on it. So it kind of goes all ways. Sometimes I like adhering to, to tradition. Sometimes I like following the mythologies. I like uh, referencing them. Sometimes I'll just get sort of playful with it and do something very abstract. So it's, um, it depends on the day. Great, <laughs> good. So here's a question. Do you work with any women glass blowers, or are they collaborators only? And then they uh, say, thank you, I love your work. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I've, uh, oh, no, I, I've worked with many, many um, female glass blowers. Yeah, um, I've, I've had, uh, you know, over my, I was losing track now, uh, 37 years of blowing glass, I've worked with many, many women um, and uh, taught with them. Uh, uh, very, very talented glass blowers, uh, Catherine Gray, Nadej, Dej Nitez, all the, I mean, there's, there's a lot of women in glass blowing and it's, um, yeah, it's very cool. In fact, you know, the Pilchuck Glass School is going to start highlighting some, uh, in going into its 50th year, there's, they're going to be highlighting a lot of women in glass, um, uh, you know, hosting or helping curate uh, shows uh, in honor of the 50th year of the Pilchuck Glass School. Um, they'll be hip happening, um, they, I think they're happening nationally. I'm not sure of the different uh, list, but Pilchuck Glass School, you know, you could probably um, find out more about those exhibitions on the, uh, on their website. Great, thank you. So I'm going to take a quick break on questions with just a statement. Leroy, you're going to like this. Uh, so it says, this is not a question, but just want to say, this is such a wonderful experience. Please do it again with Leroy and so many of the other artists he represents. Kudos mm. to you, Leroy. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, we, we actually started a, a, a Blue Rain video blog, and you can get that on our site or go to YouTube channel and subscribe. Cool. Thank yeah. you. So back to Preston. Did the art of Emily Carr influence you in any way? Uh, you know, I, I find it to be quite inspiring. Um, I've been up to Vancouver and seen some of her work in person in museums. And yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of got a very uh, kind of mystical quality to it. Um, 
um, akin to you know what we call the the Northwest Mystics that were uh, you know here in the in the in the Seattle area and and uh, spread around uh, Mark Toby and um, um, uh, <laughs> I can't, uh, can't quite remember all their names. I, I am I am more of a 3D person. Um, I love sculpture um, more so than painting. Uh, that's just my you know I, I I say I always say 3D. I love 3D. <laughs> 3D more than 2D. I have I I love paintings now. I've grown I've grown uh, to appreciate uh, them more. You know now that I'm hanging around with painters. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> So here's a question from admirers of yours from Washington, D.C., and they are eager to know if you are represented in the National Museum of the American Indian on the National Mall. Yes, yes. Um, I have a, a piece there that was commissioned. It's a, it's a raven form with a, uh, an illuminated ball in its beak, um, uh, and it is um, that was there uh, at the inaugural opening. Um, and then, as as I mentioned, the museum show that's currently touring will be there um, in about a year, two year and a half. Right. And I think it's there for a year or almost a year. So just two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, how are you handling the pandemic? And is it or will it affect any of your future works or endeavors? I think it will. I mean, I, I've been, um, you know, the last show kind of serendipitously turned into like a, more of an amulet, uh, a healing amulet uh, focus. And I didn't intend it to be that, but it just ended up that way. So in the process of making objects and stockpiling them and building a show, it's like, okay, this is, uh, this is what it is. Um, uh, you know, I, I've been managing fairly well um, in during this. I've just been working. I mean, uninterrupted time. I've been pretty productive and just, you know, making as much work as possible. And I was lucky to, um, you know, to be able to keep my uh, my team uh, employed. <laughs> you know, I have uh, four uh, four uh, employees that helped me on a more or less a full-time basis. Um, so I, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, keep them working. And so, yeah, I've been, it's been a really strange time, but, you know, I've just been uh, drawing, drawing, working, working, and blowing glass a little bit. So um, that, I think that as this, as, as it, progresses you know this is I'll, I'll i'll start to think more about how can i bring it into the artwork um yeah great last question oh so, yes uh is all glass for blowing equal <laughs> is, is some easier to work or to create three-dimensional images um, I'm moving to my power cord because I'm almost running out of batteries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that was the last question. <laughs> yeah. uh, the um, the work uh, the glass that I work with is a specially designed glass that um, is soft enough to manipulate. Um, it it is uh, has a lot of uh, fluxes and and so it's called soda lime glass. So. It is a, a glass that is specially designed for um, for hand, you know, for blowing. Um, and uh, where is oh here it is. <laughs> so, anyways, that is a uh, and it you know it's like the we call it the coefficient of expansion. It's the the glass that we work with is specially formulated to accommodate all these colors that we work with. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, that is um, very specific, um, and I work with a glass that is um, pre-melted, and then it becomes a. Um, oops. Yeah, so this glass becomes, uh, um, you know, all of a lot of the 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 bad stuff is already sort of burned away, and so when I'm remelting it, it, it's a little a little less, you know, caustic. Right. Yeah. So someone snuck in a final question. If you have the power, 
<laughs> I do. Okay, good. Woo! So we'll sneak down to one percent, folks. <laughs> oh my goodness! So, uh, nice recovery. Yeah. Uh, so this question is, and this will be the final question, I promise. Okay. Have you worked with Aboriginal figures? Uh, you know, I, I did um, um, a cultural art exchange uh, uh, to Australia, where I went up into the Northern Territory, and I and I. Um, got to visit a fellow that I met actually in Seattle, um, really amazing guy, uh, John Bawa Marwili, uh, who's a cultural leader in that, this particular area, um, was a um, you know painter, traditional painter on cedar bark and um, you know, he carved a little bit too, um, you know, often right out of the, you know, the um, uh, a tree, a, a log, you know, a, a small log. We cut figures out of it and then he painted up. Um, but so at one point I, I was able to bring uh, him to Seattle. Uh, well, they, they, you know, they, they managed, they sent him up to Seattle and we worked together. Um, and this was about five years ago. I think the couple of the pieces, at least one of them uh, is in the, the museum exhibition. Um, but anyway, it was, the, it was early December and it was um, snowing, and um, I th I want to say that they'd never seen snow before, but I um, I can't, can't be sure. But there were definitely um, it was interesting because you know it gets so so hot in the northern part of Australia, um, and they were talking about like you know well you know let's not go over to this other you know kind of province over here in Australia. It's it's only in the uh, it's only in the 80s. It's kind of cold, you know. Just wait for it to warm up a little bit. You know? So I was like, "Wow!" So I was wondering how they were really going to, you know, manage in the in the, you know, rainy, cold, snowy, and snowy Seattle. But uh, it was a good time. It was really fun to have them up. Right. So I just have to comment that I have never heard the word pet associated with a grizzly bear <laughs> and so your grandmother must have been an amazing human being <laughs> yes yes the, i mean so the the full disclosure of the story is somebody their family was hunting and they shot a grizzly and then they found the cubs so they brought oh. them back into the village and so she kept it tied up behind the the house and of course you know when the grizzly bear gets to to be a little uh, bigger, you know, gets a little, you know, more dangerous, right? Um, and so finally somebody came by, it was um, a traveler of some sort of, you know, um, uh, European traveler and said, hey, you know, we should take that, you know, and I wanted to, so they took the little, uh, the bear, I don't know how big it was at that point, but they donated it to a zoo. So that's what happened to the bear. <laughs> Sure. And um, and then you know they always talk about how how sad my great grandmother was when she had to give up her pet. You know, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, Preston and Leroy, you are both amazing human beings, and we really appreciate your time tonight. It was just really wonderful to hear from you both and to talk about Preston, your art, and Leroy, your incredible relationship with not only Preston, but so many native artists. So thank you both. I really right. appreciate it. Um, thank you. Goodness cheese, goodness cheese, Lisa, and, and click it. Thank you. So I just want everyone to know that Preston's work will be featured in an upcoming exhibition at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture here in Santa Fe. The exhibit opens next April and it is called Clearly Indigenous Native Visions Reimagined in Glass. It will showcase over 130 glass art objects created by 29 Native American artists, four Pacific Rim artists from New Zealand and Australia, and leading glass artist, Dale Chihuly. I'll be sending information to our attendees tonight in the event you are interested in sponsoring this exhibition. I hope you enjoyed the interview and I thank again Leroy and Preston and all of you for participating. Have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>